Section three of Christmas Comes But Once a Year by John Layton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The morning after the festivities, London oversleeps itself, and awaking, finds it Boxing Day. Variegated dips are being disseminated among delighted dirty juveniles, whilst the boys seem chagrined at notices for the extinction of abuses or suppression of Christmas boxes, which seems only to make them the more pertinacious at Victoria Villa, for an irregular dustman has chalked the post, and the postman vowed to mark Mr. Brown. The turncock is turned off, the waits have to wait a little longer, and the beadle, who declared Mr. Brown no generous churchwarden, has, withal, found enough alcohol to make him stupid before night, causing that dignitary to cry a lost boy instead of a girl, and to see twice as many posts round St. Stiff's as usual. Taking half of them to be boys about to vault over the other half, he rushes on to disperse them, soundly chastising the granite. All the little boys secure their mites before midday, taking their posts at the gallery door of a popular theatre five hours before opening, to practice that rare virtue, patience, at the shrine of hot codlings and George Barnwell. Master Ichabod Strap, in his richest yellow breeches and burnished badge of St. Stiff the Martyr, is perambulating the parish with his gay phylactery or Christmas piece, The History of Joseph, painted, like the coat, in many colours. He shows it to Mrs. Brown, who approves the performance, stroking the head of modest and ingenuous worth that blushed at its own praise, measuring the boy at a glance, and proffering him promotion in the shape of an uniform of buttons, just vacated by a youth called by his peers, Nobby Jones, but by his mistress, Alfonso, who, having grown to the great risk of buttons and stitches, was dispossessed of his regimentals, being sent home one dark night in his bedgown. Ichabod promises to resign that title and all connection with the dirty boys, to reign as Alfonso, the second page. Being missed by Mr. Spoaf, for whom he used to blow the organ in the little second floor, a bereavement Mrs. B. enjoyed, saying she wondered how the unworthy little animal would raise the wind now. There is an universal adage about risking sprats to capture herrings, a sport not unknown to our cosmopolite captain, for he had fished in troubled waters, and hunted for a dinner many a time. He knew the traps and snares to secure game, the days and seasons. So on Boxing Day he baits the servants with crowns, Tommy with a sovereign, Angelina with the keepsake, Jemima with a modern ancient missal, or portion of scripture made dear and difficult to read presenting Mrs. B. with the last new art manufacture, the knowing blade a brazen-faced sharper to remove blunt, and procuring for Mr. B. the skin of the identical Bengal tiger he killed, as may be seen from a legend running up the backbone, though an inscription on the tip of the tail states it to be sold by Fitch of Regent Street. The bait secures its amount of flatfish, for that evening Captain de Camp was more than usually lucky. He caught enough at Ecarte to clear himself, a freak of fortune that caused no asperity in the noble breast of Brown, for here are his own thoughts in his own words. December 26th, Wednesday, Boxing Day my dear friend de Camp has this day given us all tokens of the warmest attachment, sadly wanting to do something for me, colonial, war, or admiralty. Not requiring anything just now, this will form an admirable reserve. 
I must in the meantime profit by his refined society, as I hope and trust the girls will by his sons. If there be any drawback to the delight I feel, it is the non-arrival of his luggage, for I am personally inconvenienced by his wearing my best coat. I may be over-scrupulous in wishing he would return the books he devours with such avidity. Mrs. B. says she thinks the paragon of knowledge swallows them, for they are not to be found. Next morning Ichabod enters the brown suit and service, having spent boxing night and the proceeds of the Christmas piece at the play, where he saw Jane Shaw and Harlequin House that Jack built, the plot and tricks of which he recounted to Master Tommy, as he took that young gentleman for a walk, inoculating him with a great desire to go and behold it. So, after having coaxed his mother, teased his father, and cried his lovely blue eyes into a good imitation of red-veined marble, the youth triumphed, for on Thursday evening they all went to the play in the fusty fly from Drone's yard, driven by old Drone in his pepper-and-salt suit of pseudo-livery that looked as if he always brushed it with the curry-comb, and so tindery about the breast from the number of marriage favours annually pinned there that it is a wonder it holds together. Alfonso rode upon the box, giving the vehicle a certain amount of smartness. On their arrival under the dirt embrowned portico of the theatre, they are cordially recognised by the de Camps, who, thinking it a pity the box should not be filled, have just dropped down to see London Assurance, intending to quit before the pantomime, but forgetting to do so after all. During the play, Master Tommy disposes of a vast quantity of oranges and sponge cakes vanishing between each act to obtain a fresh supply, making butterflies of the bill, and causing the double-barrelled lorgnette, which was hired for the occasion from an adjacent oyster-shop, to slip off the cushion falling upon a bald gentleman in the pit, the excited little pest remarking everything, and fairly shouting at the discovery of Alfonso below, until chid by his mother. Oh, that we could participate in thy youthful enthusiasm, or feel pleased at that hotchpotch the overture, or a thrill when the muffin bell tinkles, causing the lovely drop scene that combined the grandeur of the pretty Parthenon with the sublimity of Virginia water to vanish into its own intensely blue sky, disclosing the harlequin house that Jack built and Mr. John Bull's huge pasteboard thick head snoring like thunder in a property summer-house, an elephantine blue-bottle on his proboscis, and a sleeping bulldog the size of an Alderney steer at his feet. Here Master Brown with a grin calls the house Victoria Villa, and the pasteboard mask his papa. Now enters the rat to eat the good things that lay in the house that John built, represented by a stealthy, seedy gentleman, who, after reading a board intimating that apartments were to let, crept slyly past the sleepy bull to mount the house steps, and there deliver himself of the following doggerel in a mellifluous voice. I search for lodgings. Here's the very thing, though I've not got a rap. I think I'll ring, for all I want is to be taken in as I would others take. Sure, tis no sin to do to others only tit for tat, so here goes, rat, tat, tat to tat. The orchestra, loud in wishing to know who's dat knocking at de door, and Master Tom, deep in the bill, with Mr. Rat, who is there described as a scamp, an unknown term to Tom, for he asked its meaning, observing that Uncle Brick said Captain de Camp was a scamp. This question remained unanswered, for no one heard it except the captain, who felt a great itching to pull a young monkey's ears, 
but did not. The cat, a sort of puss in boots with a short stick and strip of paper, entering to catch the rat, is worried by the dog, who is tossed by a cow with a very crumpled horn, who was milked by a maid, said to be very forlorn, who is kissed by a sweet-looking beggar all tattered and torn, the loving pair being likened to Jemima and Latimer by Master Tom, causing his sister's face to redden as a furnace that heightened the more it was fanned. And when the priest, all shaven and shorn, whom Tom called the Reverend Loyala Beckett, commenced marrying the couple, then Miss Jemima entertained serious notions of fainting, and probably would, had not the solemnization of matrimony been violated by the priest, who shed his sackcloth surplice, vaulting over the rails of the altar between the astonished couple, leaving that sanctuary to change into a matchmaker's, appearing himself a perfect clown, stating that sublime, veritable truth, Here we are again working his geometric, chromatic physiognomy into endless contortions, extending his arms like the sails of contrary windmills, twiddling his legs like a fly, and when called upon by unearthly voices for tippity witchet, appears so scared that he tumbles through the big drum to oblige them with the song from the slips instantly afterwards presenting himself upon the stage, dilating his spotted inexpressibles, until they put him in mind of a friend, Pantaloon, that, by a curious coincidence, resides at a tailor's in the background, having just completed a patchwork skin for Harlequin, who, the instant he is fitted, flies through the panel of a door inscribed cutting out room into the next house of florists, there to obtain his favourite flower, the columbine, with whom he has a long dance in the centre of a very solitary street, whilst clown and pantaloon arrange a partnership concern which they carry on in the middle of the road in front of the shop, until clown renders himself more plague than profit by warming his partner's lumber region with a very red-hot goose, basting him with the sleeve-board and sticking him to the road with wax, clown dissolving partnership by walking off in a new rap-rascal with the cash-box that no one may rob them. The best things must come to an end, and so does the pantomime with a gorgeous display of red fire, tinsel and gold, real water and the electric light, all chopped off in the middle by the descending curtain. The box fronts have been enveloped in their nightgowns, the columbine is clattering in patterns to her lodgings, the harlequin has been bolted out, unable to vault through the fanlight, and the clown is running in his painted face, having forgotten to wash it, for at home he left a dear wife seriously ill to come and be funny in sadness. Drone's fly is homeward bound, heavily laden. The young men of the party have dived into the Welsh rarebit warren, there to spend the early hours of the morning listening to sentimental songs chanted amid fumes of tobacco and spirits, to hear sorry wit and make vapid remarks. The great feature of the evening being a melodramatic dirge supposed to be sung by a condemned felon, a triumphant lamentation and delineation of brutal character, so eloquent and thrilling in its monosyllabic groans of anguish that it is a wonder the kidneys consumed in such numbers are ever digested. But, alas, such is life. Those most swayed by animal propensities see the least warning therein. As the thief combines business and pleasure at the gallows' foot, so, with the frequenters of the warren, they imbue their sentiment and supper, only digesting the latter. Wellesley has devoured several rabbits. 
and Latimer disposed of numberless kidneys, whilst young Brown has had to wait the usual forty minutes for a steak, and in the interim had five stouts, four goes, and several cigars, i.e. with assistance from the decamps, who have made free I to order goblets of champagne, and in the end, not having change to repair the damage, a mean but true term as often applied, they get young Brown to pay the complicated sum added up by the waiter upon a mahogany ditto in lieu of a slate, with stale stout spilled in the corner, receipted with a wipe of the towel. And so, home in the safety cab, with large wheels and a spanking grey, lettered along the side, nil desperandum, thinking handsome is as handsome does, tumbling into bed just before the peep of day, and five hours after Mr. Brown had made up his diary, writing against December the 27th, Thursday, that he had taken Tom and the girls to a pantomime, been agreeably surprised to find the decamps there, especially the sons, who did sit in front with Jemmy and Angel, looking made as much for one another as he could desire. Tom behaving very sadly, and were it not for his mother, the boy should spend the vacations at a Yorkshire school. Twice every year, in the dog days and December, is the house turned topsy-turvy. It may be sport to you, Master Tom, but his death to us. End of section three.